Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this month's webinar, where we're looking at the selection of appropriate accounting policies, uh, in particularly uh, understanding the basic alternatives. Um, now, as always, I'm joined by Kevin Frobus, my long-running uh, partner with these webinars. So, hello, Kevin. Hello, Aletta, and how is everybody else today on the panel? It's good to be <laughs> with you. And I will just say before everybody gets confused, um, the web the webcam says that I'm Ashley Woodley, and that 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 is just a misnomer. We had a bit of an IT issue, so I'm Kevin Frobus. Um, I'm logging in on Ashley's web website, but it is good to at least have made this webinar a letter, and it's good to see all of you. Uh, Kevin, you would not know how happy I was to see you, by the way, so welcome. <laughs> and, and the real Ashley, um, we'll say hello to the real Ashley Woodley. Yes, good morning. Um, yeah, hopefully people get confused and think Kevin is me, so then I uh, get a good reputation after all this webinar. <laughs> happens all the time to me, Ashley, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so our normal three presenters um, here, and we also have a guest, uh, Marie Griffin, and uh, she'll uh, speak very soon. So hello, Marie, and thank you for joining all the accounting nerds today. <laughs> thank you, and thanks for having me. All right, so as I said today, we're looking at the selection of appropriate accounting policies. And then next month, we are continuing the magic and we're talking about uh, aligning uh, these accounting policies uh, with your organization's stage of life. So basically, today is a bit of a soft introduction um, to a few um, more difficult decisions around accounting policies next month. Um, I thought I would like to start the session, um, though, by circling back to the webinar we've done last month and also the webinar we've looked at in December last year. And that is that a lot of entities in Australia has to transition to general purpose financial statements. Now, Kevin and I um, and our a broader team have put our heads together and we've come up with five steps to successful a GPFS transition. And we said as a first step, uh, you have to do a GPFS assessment, you know, to establish whether you are required to prepare general purpose financial statements in future. Um, if not, end of, end of the five-step process. If you have to, let's go to step two. I have to prepare these general purpose financials. Um, now I have to review, I have to do a GPFS health check, review how you are currently preparing your financials and then consider how do I go from my current place to GPFS, so what are the different transitional approaches and consider what's the best approach. Uh, in step three, we do a bit of a gap analysis where we say, okay, if I go to general purpose, I have a little bit of a, maybe a knowledge gap. I need to sharpen up my knowledge on certain accounting standards. Um, maybe I have a, a gap around system requirements. So identify the gap so we can address it. Then in step four, we look at implementing our uh, proposed transition transitional method, implementing systems, um, making sure we have the knowledge. And finally, right at the end, when we prepare our financials, our GPFS financials, think about the disclosures. Are we going to do full tier one disclosures or the simplified disclosures in ASB uh, 1060? So it's a five step to GPFS transition. And as you know, and as we've discussed on multiple occasions, 30 June 2021 is kind of the last option to, uh, or the last opportunity for 30 June year ends and to make use of some of the transitional relief um, when you go to GPFS. <coughs> so there's a link here uh, to our uh, website where we explain these five steps uh, a bit further uh, that you can look at. But I wanted to put it out there, you know, I think we have to start early and we have to make a concerted effort to get our GPFS transition um, correct. Um, the other thing is that we've launched a series of GPFS virtual workshops. And again, there's a link to the 
the page. So in addition to these monthly webinars where we talk about latest developments, these are a series of 20 workshops running one a week for 20 weeks on uh, upskilling um, on various accounting standards. So the idea is over a two year period, we look at all the accounting standards, but this year we maybe look at the more problematic ones. If you wanna go to general purpose financials, do you know everything about business combinations, uh, consolidations, joint arrangements, associates, impairment, etc. Now each workshop is two hours, practical case studies, and again you can read a little bit more on our website. So this is really addressing that gap analysis step three. Um, now as IFRS experts we are really keen to work with you. Um, I think in the first instance, do, step one, do you need GPFS, but in particular that step two, a, a GPFS health check. What are you currently doing? How big will this transition be for you? Um, and then, you know, we go through the rest of the process. So a little bit of a, um, a throwback to last month's webinar where we talk about the whole transitioning. So that is as a start. The next thing is, um, over recent months, a number of people have asked me about payment times reporting scheme. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of people were a little bit of unsure uh, who at BDO um, or at the various firms can help them with payment times reporting scheme. You know, is that this within tax or IFRS or where does it sit? Um, so what I've done is I've asked Marie Griffin um, from our Brisbane firm to come and give us a bit of an overview of payment times reporting scheme. Why is this on the horizon or actually why is it here from 1 January this year? What does it mean? Who does it impact? Um, and who can you speak to if you're looking for additional information? Uh, so Marie, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks for letter. So the Payment Times Reporting Scheme. Um, so this is a, a scheme that impacts large business and large government enterprises. And as the letter said, it's already started. So this scheme started on 1st of January, 2021. And we have had the situation with clients that weren't even aware of it. So we're already into March um, and there's some information gathering that um, is required there. So the idea is large business will need to report their small business payment terms and times twice a year, and then it will be made publicly available on the payment times register. So it's important to get that information right because it's going to be out there in public um, where either individuals or various businesses can access that information. So it's come about, there's been previous inquiries which show significant impact of late payments on small businesses, which include constraints on their cash flow, the capacity to hire staff, and then in turn that um, can inhibit their growth. The idea of the scheme is to increase transparency around large business payment performance and also to create incentives for improved payment times and practices to small business. So the idea is we help small business and the public decide who to do business with from reviewing the public register. So it's a way to help small business um, improve their cash flows and to help large businesses then create more incentives uh, and different ways of doing business to try and improve their payments or payment terms. Thanks, Aletta. So who has to report? Any business that's constitutionally covered and constitutionally covered is uh, under section 51 X of the constitution. You'll be able to um, find some more information on that. But basically it's any enterprise that's carrying on a business in Australia and they meet the income threshold of over $100 million in total annual income. And that's linked with your tax return also. So they'll be able to access that information from um, your total income and your tax return. Commonwealth corporate entities or Commonwealth companies uh, that meet the income threshold are also pulled in. 
And it's also important um, to note that some state entities can also be covered by the Commonwealth um, Act. So we recommend that if you are even a state entity that you still look at the rules and regulations around that in case you get pulled into the system. Entities with a total income of over $10 million that are members of a controlling corporation that have a combined income of over $100 million. So you need to look at the whole group. And again, this is linked to um, the income tax legislation. So it, it pulls in the whole um, group that you're, the business can be involved with. And it's also, and sorry, and then you look at that, if that whole group is over $100 million, then it's caught by the system. And then you need to look at the entities on an individual basis. If those entities individually in the group are over $10 million, then they become a reporting entity and need to report. So you can have situations in the group where some single entities may be under $10 million, so they're not a reporting entity. So even though for income tax purposes, you can do consolidated tax returns uh, and only one tax return is required, under the Payment Times Reporting Scheme, it's at the reporting is at an entity level and not at a head entity level or a consolidated level. So you look at the consolidated group to work out whether they're caught in the 100 million threshold. Then if they're caught, you still need to look at each individual entity in that group to determine if they're over or under the 10 million. It's also important to note that the head entity of the um, group, so of that controlling group, they need to report even if their income is less than $10 million. So if you've got an Australian head entity that has um, income of $5 million, they still need to report if they're the head entity. Uh, charities are exempt, but only if they're registered with the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Act 2012. So it's important to note that we've had some clients that have thought they've fallen outside the system because they're a charity, but then on further investigation, they weren't actually registered um, under that act. And so they're caught in this system as well and need to report. So you might see out there where um, it's saying that charities are exempt, but you will need to just confirm that they are registered before you can um, actually um, wholeheartedly say that you are exempt from that. Thanks, Aleta. Um, I thought, uh, Marie, maybe we should have a look. I've prepared a poll to see whether uh, people believe they um, would be a, you know, a group that would be um, impacted. So mm -hmm. I'll open the poll and, and see what people think. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that you're a business or a group that's a reporting entity? Um, I thought it would be interesting to see from my, from our attendees, where do they fall? Uh, it's mm -hmm. a fairly high threshold, um, Marie. I think for me, yeah. a big catch in my client base has been not-for-profits. I think some not-for-profits thought yeah. they were, were, you know, exempt. And then some not-for-profits are not registered with the ACNC. They are registered with, with ASIC and, and therefore we had to say, unfortunately, you covered. Um, yeah. yeah and, and, you know, some clients said to us, you know, we were completely unaware of this. I think this is one of the... Yeah new regulations that went a little bit under the radar with all the, the COVID activity last year. I think um, it definitely did. We've had lots of clients that haven't been aware of it. Um, there have been some letters sent out um, advising that um, large business um, have been caught, but even some of our large business um, yeah. haven't seemed to have got the letter or it's sitting in someone's in tray and just um, hasn't been passed on to the relevant. Uh, people, so there is a lot of unknown around it at this stage. Yeah, and I think absolutely. The other thing, sorry, the other thing too is it can it doesn't only catch companies as well. So you could have large trusts or partnerships um, if they yeah. still meet that income threshold, they're caught as well. So it's important to note it's not just companies that are caught. Yeah, absolutely. So I th I really think this is something that I I wanted to bring to the webinar because I realised you know there's a little bit of a 
uncertainty and, and maybe just um, a lack of awareness of the issue, just in speaking to my own clients. Um, yeah. Interestingly, I'll, I'll share uh, the results um, just to get an idea of what people think. Um, you know, do you think it would impact you or not? Uh, there you can see, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's an in uh, interesting finding. 30% of our attendees definitely impacted. 19% yeah. it may be, we need to investigate. 43% uh, I don't believe so. And 8% have no idea. So I, I think maybe yeah. the homework is an unexpected, yeah. not IFRS related homework is maybe uh, just assess whether you caught and who in your organization is looking at this. I think that's yeah. important. Yeah, Marie, that's right. I think oh, it just I'll needs throw. to be considered, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll throw over to you for the next one. Mm -hmm. So if you're caught, there's practical considerations then for large business uh, that needs to be um, also thought about at the same time. So are the board or your governing body aware of the scheme and the impact it may have? So as we've just been discussing, there's plenty of businesses out there that aren't even aware that this scheme has already started, let alone what they need to do and what they need to capture. Uh, so we recommend um, advising your governing body, whether that's the board, um, it could be trustees, it could be partners, um, but just let them know that this is on the radar and that some investigation may need to occur or even that you feel that they are caught and just letting them um, know what that is. Because there's also um, the penalty system, like under the tax regime, if um, there's non-reporting or false and misleading information, uh, things like that, it can um, get quite hefty with the penalties. Um, so it's always best to put that up front with the board as well, so they're well and truly aware of it. And also, are you aware of what needs to be reported? As most finance systems won't capture everything required. So some of the things that have to be reported are um, for each small business supplier, what their actual standard terms are. And then when they pay the invoices, uh, what they, it has to be um, in different bands. So like zero to 20 days. Um, if they pay after the um, receipt date, in zero to 20 days, you report the percentage and then um, it goes up into bands greater than 120 days. But the, the technicality there is you need to measure from the receipt date of the invoice. In many cases, your finance system won't actually have the receipt date because that is the date that it comes into the office. So that could be emailed in, it could be delivered, it could be posted in, it could be given a, you know, to a tradee on job site and it doesn't actually hit the office to some time later. And so there's the technicality there of it's not actually the invoice date, but the receipt date. So I don't know of too many finance systems that actually automatically capture that data. And then it's um, when working out the percentages of when the in small business invoices are paid in the different bands, um, that could well be a manual process to start with um, until the systems can calculate that for you or you can develop another reporting tool to get that information out. So there's a lot of work needs to be done with the finance systems and working out exactly what does need to be reported, what your finance system currently holds, and if there's information missing, then how do you get that information? How do you pull it all together to report it? And it's already started. Like this has been in place since 1st of January. So for that missing information from 1st of January to now, how are you going to capture that? How are you going to go back and collect that um, information? Um, I think you've moved forward on my slide as well, Aleto. Did I have anything? Um, yeah, I, I thought we we just, um, you know, there's a publication that uh, oh, we've yeah. discussed all of these issues that I've given the link to so people can mm -hmm. have a look at it. Um, and, you know, the other thing is if you're looking for a particular contact at BDO, we've got a few people who are working on it and you can see Maria is one of them. So please feel free to contact them. 
um, and, and they can help you with the, the ins and outs of the system. Um, we thought we might, after Marie's done a bit of an introduction, uh, introduction ask the question, you know, do you think we, uh, you are ready for this? Um, uh, I, I think whenever I speak to clients, they might think they're ready and they might think they've heard about it. Um, you know, but it would be interesting to see what do you feel, you know, how are you going? Uh, I can see a few people are saying absolutely, definitely they, they're ready. Kevin, oh, right. have you had, yeah, Kevin, have you had some requests in your client base? Sorry, just finding the mute button. Um, a letter, it has started to surface, I will say very recently, and it's all very new. Um, it, yeah. it, and, and, and when I'm saying that, I'm talking about the last couple of days as opposed to the last few weeks even. Oh, so it, okay. it's new on, the, new on the agenda and surfacing up. I'm actually quite glad for this session as well because it's uh, alluded me to what I need to also start to think about as these, are, these things are starting to surface up. Yeah, and I think what I found interesting, Kevin, is that um, you know, a lot of people are saying, where do I get assistance for this? Do I go to the IFRS people? Do I go to Marie that does financial management consulting? And absolutely, they can help. Uh, you can see Mark Griffiths and Sydney, you know, from Risk Advisories right. looking at it. So there's, there's so many different service lines involved here. And I just wanted mm -hmm. to put it on the radar. That's right. um, and, and it's a good thing that we're in advisory um, in, in your, your and my position, because it's allowed us to have our tentacles into an number of those service lines um, and so yeah. it, it easily sources sort of the, the answers to some of these questions. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. It can even be things like you might need to like review your internal controls and things like that to determine that the data is accurate. So there's it definitely involves um, a lot of service lines. Absolutely. And, and uh, Marie, I think the key thing are the systems, right? And that's where you yeah. help a lot of clients. So I think 21% and, and um, most people actually voted, 21% said, absolutely, we're ready for it. A number said, not sure, don't think so. So definitely, I think we've uncovered a bit of a hot issue here, Marie. So I want to say yeah. thank you very much for joining. Um, no, we really yeah. appreciate your time. That's fine. If any queries, people can just, yeah, give any of us a call. That's no problem. Email, whatever suits. Thank you very much, Marie. You're welcome yeah. to stay for the riveting I4S stuff. <laughs> I will, thank you. <laughs> but I will hide myself. <laughs> All thank right. You. So, thank you, Marie. So, today's agenda, uh, what we'll be looking at is, um, as I said, accounting policies. So, we'll start with, and Kevin will do an introduction while we're discussing this topic. Kevin came up with a topic, so I think he will have to introduce it. Uh, then we'll talk about what are accounting policies, you know, what's their purpose, how do they differ from estimates, and the interesting one is um, in our newsletter that will be published tomorrow, there's an article on the new definition of an estimate. It was just amended by the ISB and the AASB, so I've put that in. And then also, how are accounting policies selected, you know, and what do we commonly see? You know, what are the opportunities for so-called free selection? Um, and where does, manage, where, where does management get to exercise their judgment? And then right at the end, Ashley and I will help Kevin where we look at the basic alternatives across the standards. We're not looking at all the standards today. In a way, we're starting with the easy ones. And then next month, uh, we'll step up a gear and look at impayment and, and the harder ones. We look at revenue, we look at leases. Uh, so this is, I think, a soft introduction. Um, I think that's the right way to put it, Kevin. Um, but Kevin, I'll hand over to you. Uh, so you can do the introduction. This is your topic, so you run with it. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Aletta. Um, and, and yes, why are we doing this topic? And I, I probably have to admit that when we, when we put this into the agenda at the end of last year, the purpose was perhaps somewhat um, aimed towards next month's topic, which was life cycle accounting, uh, accounting policies. But as the gods um, are often on our side on these things, um, they are a whole bunch of other topics emerged, such as estimates and, 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 and so forth. And then also COVID hit, 
COVID hit, and so it, 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 it's, it's introduced to BDO a number of IPOs that are currently on the go. And so it isn't just any more about life cycle um, uh, accounting policies, which, which is primarily what we're going to do next month. There, there actually is a valid reason for us to actually go back to this topic right now, because a number of organizations have actually gotten to that point where they're saying, gee, what are our accounting policies? Why do we do what we do? And is there an opportunity for change? And that's the next slide, which is actually the, 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 the time for change. Um, the time for change is obviously, as we've been talking a lot the last couple of months about um, transitioning from special purpose to general purpose. Now, uh, transitioning from special purpose to general purpose, um, as we've mentioned, and I think we spent a bit of time on this last month, there's a three year transition period. I call it the transition tail. That's very much a thing that I've come up with because everyone's kind of going through this transition in, in different ways and different forms. We're, we're very much in, in the voluntary stage at the moment, but mandatory will hit you towards the end of the tail. And so it's important for you to think, do I want to go early and do I want to, want to get this done? But it is becoming clear that that moving from special purpose to general purpose, even if you're doing all recognition and measurement under special purpose, which is in accordance with accounting standards, you're going to have to look at that and decide to, for yourself, am I actually complying with all recognition and measurement under special purpose? Um, and, then, and then moving on to, to, uh, to general purpose. The, the IFRS 1 or the AASB 1 and the IAS 8, AASB 108, those are your sort of your gatekeeper standards. So when you're moving to uh, general purpose, um, the, the real question is, do I have the information that I, that I need, first of all, to recognize and measure all my assets and liabilities and income and expense according to the accounting standards? Do I have all the information to present to disclose that information? Once your answer to that is all yes, off you go. But obviously, that is also the gatekeeper where you will find out whether, whether you are doing anything that's inconsistent with the accounting standards. And it's those inconsistencies that, that, tend, that, that, that essentially drive accounting policies, which is how we got to this topic. Um, the accounting policies are largely the, the, the standards that, that tell you how to account for various transactions and events. But even if you are complying with those um, accounting policies and those accounting standards um, for events and, and transactions uh, and, and for recognition and measurement, if you're going through the gate, gate, gatekeeper standards, it is an opportunity to ask whether you want to carry on using the accounting policy you are using. Because accounting policies um, aren't static in the sense that you have to comply with only one way of doing things. There are alternatives. And that's really what I think Ashley and Alita are going to get to on the basics later on today. Um, and, I'll, and, and the one that comes to mind always is, do you fair value your property plan equipment or you do costless depreciation? You know, that's a basic alternative um, in the accounting. Uh, and, 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 and maybe you're doing the one and you want to move back to the other one. Now's the opportunity to ask those questions because transitioning from general purpose to special purpose through the gatekeeper standards allows you to say to yourself, do I want to stay with what I'm doing? Do I need to change because I'm not complying with something? Or am I complying but I want to choose something different because you know, maybe I'm at that life cycle stage in, my, in the entity or maybe it doesn't suit me anymore or maybe I don't want to use tax accounting anymore for my depreciation rates. Maybe it's time to use actually something something that's more specific to the entity in terms of how you actually use your, 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 your assets and so forth. So it's not only getting on board with IFRS at your transition from special purpose to general, it's also reevaluating what you're currently doing and deciding whether you actually want to do something different based on what your needs are. Of course, the other one is COVID-19. And this is what I talk about IPOs all the time. Um, a number of organizations will say that their end game or their exit, exit strategy for their owners might be an IPO in five or 10 years time. Well, that was moved up very quickly during COVID and we are seeing that in, 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 in BDO. Lots of organizations are actually just you know, running for the IPO gate even now and actually just bring it, bringing that forward. Um, but also they're, they're taking the opportunity to move from their old systems to things like cloud-based technology solutions. So there's a lot of um, research and development type expenditure going on or, or cloud-based technology investment going on. And, and, and those bring the opportunity to say, well, is the information that my systems are generating producing information that could allow me to use an alternative accounting policy to present my information. So all of this sort of came about all, all, all because of, of, of COVID-19. And then the other one, and I think Aleta, you'll probably grab this one later, is government stimulus. We have seen an enormous shift in the amount of money flowing into organizations 
um, from government stimulus. And so many organizations didn't have an accounting policy for that. So they've had to very quickly develop one. Now we've got lots of articles in our accounting news on how to account for various stimulus, job keeper. As this was happening last year, we were we were producing information that basically you know, directed you to how to formulate an accounting policy. But if you're going back and read those articles on the BDO Accounting News, it isn't all about you have to do it this way. Some of it was you need to develop an accounting policy. And so that's why we're talking about it today because you know, accounting policy, there are some choices which 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 will, which will present it in a certain way. And so those organizations have actually gotten onto the idea that they actually need a formal accounting policy for government stimulus because it's clearly started and it's not going to stop anytime soon. And it's now suddenly a big part of their operations. And so, you know, that, that change has hit us now. So let, I think that's the, the why. Um, the, the 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 time for change is also then a time for opportunity. So that's the that's the the opportunity is now is the time to say, well, can I move my financial reporting from compliance to an effective tool for business? If you're going to IPO anytime soon, you're going to learn very quickly that accounting statements aren't just a compliance exercise. They're actually a tool to communicate to your shareholders or investors, and you're going to have to get on top of that really really quickly. And so the time for the opportunity is to say, well, do my accounting policies align with my systems? Align Aligned with my narrative, aligned with what my investors want to see, and can I actually use financial statements more than just a year-end thing, and actually use it as an effective tool for business? So that's why we're talking about this um, today. And unless I wasn't actually clear on whether I was going to do this, so I just keep going. I think um, in terms of accounting policies, um, so I'll, I'll keep talking about what are accounting policies. These are the specific principles, bases, conventions, rules, and practices applied by an entity in preparing its financial statements. Now, um, in in terms of this, it's a nice mouthful, but it's really it's what we do and 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 and, and, and what we apply to recognize, measure, present, and disclose. Recognize, measure, present, and disclose. But there's another component to that, which is maybe missing from the slide. It's also scope. And this is actually one of the really important parts of IFRS, which we maybe maybe don't put in a lot of, enough attention to when we actually do this. Um, when it comes to the scope of transactions, which accounting standard do you actually fall into? And we are finding um, at the moment that a lot of complex instruments and you know embedded derivatives, um, uh, convertible note type instruments, lots of different uh, diff different types of transactions, especially around financing. And it's not actually clear which accounting standard they fall into. And it's the same with the government the government stimulus. Wasn't actually clear some of the government stimulus which accounting standard it fell in. Was it a government grant? Was it something at government assistance? Was it a tax, an income tax? And there were there were a multitude of accounting um, uh, standards that possibly could apply. So it's not only recognize, measure, uh, disclose, and present. It's also what accounting standard is the one that dictates the, the bases, the principles, the conventions, and the rules. And that by itself can be a skill. And I'll let you in a little secret. I will say to Aletta, and I think she agrees, that, that the IFRS advisors, we are the ones who know how to navigate the scope paragraphs. You know, once you know which standard you're in, in a way you kind of know how to do it, but it's actually deciding which 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 standard you're in. That's the trick to IFRS advisory or to IFRS advisory. And now I've given it away, and now we're all over a letter. Now they now they know our secret, and it's all done. But it is sometimes <laughs> it, it it is actually the scope um, of, of where that falls in, and and the next standard actually will dictate that. Um, accounting policy setting is not actually a free choice. But not really. There is a bit of free choice here. But actually, there's a hierarchy in a way in, in, in selecting your accounting policies. This, this may be the most important slide when it comes to selecting accounting policies. Um, the first step is whether you actually have an IFRS standard that specifically applies to a transaction. And that's why I, I say to Aletta a lot of the times, and, and Ashley's learning this as well as she goes, which standard are you in the scope is actually the most important thing mm. it's oft, often easy when you when you look at things like purchasing property plant and equipment but if you purchase property plant and equipment but you don't own it so it's kind of like a lease are you in the leasing standard but maybe 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 there's a service element that applies to it so maybe you're in the revenue standard you know and all those sorts of questions pop up but the first step is which standard are you in and if there is a standard that applies to the transaction you must apply that standard in other words your accounting policy selections will be dictated by the standard you are in 
The next step though, is if you don't have a standard that specifically applies, you then have to consider whether there's a standard that deals with a similar and related issue and then apply that standard. So this is essentially building an accounting policy based on a similar transaction and where that transaction is accounted for in the accounting standards. And then only is there a step um, where you go look at the conceptual framework. Now this comes, th th this may not seem obvious to you at the moment, but the, the, the days of heading to the conceptual framework first are, are long, long gone. You can see in this, in this hierarchy that conceptual framework really comes, comes in step three. And, and there are so many standards that deal with so many different transactions. Now, I'd be very surprised if you don't find your standard in step one and two, which is what we, what we find generally. We, we sometimes refer to step three to assist our thinking in which standard do we going to go to. But it's actually step one and step two are probably where we spend most of our time because it's very seldom that an accounting standard hasn't actually tried to address a particular type of transaction. Uh, that, 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 that's out there. So, so that's your that that's your step by step guide. And as I said earlier, step two, for example, we spent a lot of time in step two with the government stimulus in the last six or eight months because there's a lot of government stimulus sort of floating out there right now. And whether whether there was a particular eye for a standard that you should go to to determine whether you are recognizing, measuring, and so forth in accordance with the counting standard. The other thing I just want to actually paint a picture, and I and I'm not actually sure um, if, if it comes up later, but we are dealing with a lot of organizations who are trying to do IPOs at the moment. So they're stepping up to, you know, full IFRS general purpose accounts. Some of them are actually coming from a special purpose. So they're going, they're not, they're not going the traditional way where they're building up over time and they, they're developing their accounting policies. They're literally going from special purpose to general purpose in one full swoop. And a number of uh, are those uh, CFOs and finance chiefs keep talking to me about prudence. And, and conservative, and I, I want to die every time they speak about it, because it's also not necessarily a concept that that often shines through. It is true that conservative or, or prudence is still a, it's still a basic principle of accounting, but they tend to think that if they go conservative with anything they do, they will have met the accounting standards and that's actually not how it works anymore and so if, if you want to take something away if, if you're talking prudence conservative and, you, and you're trying to make things as prudent or conservative as possible you've missed the point on accounting policy selection and you need to go back to the drawing board because the accounting standards although they embed embed accrual accounting and, and sort of a, 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 con, a concept of, of, of conservativeness behind it the accounting standards actually dictate measurement scope recognition, presentation, and disclosure. And you will find that they will tell you how in those standards, how you need to account for certain things and what your policy alternatives are, which is what we're doing today. But they don't, sometimes don't tell you that, you, that conservative gets you out of jail. Conservative is not a get out of jail card anymore. That's what we did before. If we didn't want to recognize too much revenue too soon, or we didn't want to overvalue our assets. But the thing is, is there's so much now in steps one and two in terms of actual standards out there that deal with certain transactions that are actually quite specific on how you do things. You know, um, fair value measurement, for example, has level one, two, and three inputs, and that's quite specific. You're not really applying conservative there. You're actually applying an input that maximizes the external evidence in level one down to level three, which minimizes external evidence. So that's how they apply conservative. Conservative is actually where the source of the input comes for fair value measurements, not being conservative in terms of the actual end value. You know, so it's those types of principles that you're looking for in developing your accounting policy. And and and, and like I said, if you if you're thinking that conservative and prudence is the way to go, today you should be really thinking about what well actually maybe I should start to look at this accounting policy thing. Um, okay, all right, so yes, a letter. I think the other thing, um, maybe two comments. Um, I agree with you. If if I hear the words conservative prudence, immediately I'm a bit worried um, because I know that's, you know, we have to look at the scope of the standard, et cetera. And the other thing is uh, a lot of times people still refer to matching and we know matching is also dead. You know, so those are the kind of words in the literature yes. that, that's not supported by the standards anymore. That's one point. The other point I, th I thought I should make is a around step two um, that you've got here, around consider whether an IFRS standard or another IFRS standards uh, deal with a similar or related issue. 
And, and a fantastic example here would be business combinations under common control. Mm. And, and my point is you don't look for a related standard and then just apply it. You look for a related or a similar standard and then you have an assessment whether that standard um, would reflect the substance of the arrangement. You know, so there is an overlay of thinking. Yes, there's a similar standard, but is it appropriate? Would it present the substance? Let's think about it. It's not just applying it. Um, so if which I've is, got a business faithful, faithful representation, which is the the the, the, yes. the the base objective of accounting policy, faithful representation of the event or transaction. Correct. So I think people should just think I, I'm not just going to a similar standard and applying it. I then say, okay, there's something similar, but let's think whether that should or would right. lead to faithful representation. Um, but but it's a good way to think about it. I won't interrupt. No, 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 you keep going. <laughs> uh, now, we, we do have a couple of slides coming up now on what accounting estimates are. Um, and Aletta, I think you put some of this yes. together. So please, please yes. jump in as you go, or do, you can take this one on because I know this actually links to your policy that uh, of the article that's coming out tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. So it's interesting in that the ISB have come out with a clarification on what are accounting estimates. And I see in my first paragraph, it's not AS8, it's IAS8. Um, currently, you know, it only defines changes in accounting estimates um, and an accounting estimate. Um, so now they are introducing of uh, and, and, and um, the recent amendment introduces a definition of accounting estimates as follows. So accounting estimates are monetary amounts in financial statements that are subject to measurement uncertainty. And they give us some examples of accounting estimates. So, you know, if we come up with an expected credit loss, net realizable values of inventories, fair value of an asset or a liability or a depreciation expense or a provision for a warranty, all of those are, is, are situations where we make an accounting estimate. We come up with monetary amounts in financials, but there's measurement uncertainty around it. Um, and I think that's the key thing that we're looking at, that measurement uncertainty. And then they're saying, okay, entities use measurement techniques and they use inputs to develop these accounting estimates. And these measurement techniques could include um, an estimation technique. Um, you know, we come up with an estimation technique to come up with expected credit losses, come up with uh, values, in use if we've got cash, cash generating units, but we also sometimes have value, valuation techniques. Um, you know, so do we use an income approach or a market approach? So we've got all these te techniques, uh, whether it's valuation techniques, estimation techniques, but that fits into measurement. And that measurement technique combined with inputs um, from an organization would ultimately give us that accounting estimate. Now, if you look um, at that diagram on the previous slide, the amendments clarified that there is a change in an accounting estimate when there's a change in either of the following. Either there's a change in the input or there's a change in that measurement technique. So I just want to go back to that. So if you look at your a measurement technique, it could be estimation techniques, it could be valuation techniques. As soon as you start to change those, we're saying we have a change in an estimate. Um, remember, if, if we have a change and it's actually as a result of a prior period error, you, you, we have to apply it retrospectively, but usually um, if we have a change in an input, or if we have a change in a measurement technique, either of those, uh, we have a change in an accounting estimate. Um, so I think what's important is to understand that you can have changes in accounting policies, you can have changes around these estimates, um, but we could also have errors. And, and, and usually it's difficult to distinguish be between all of them. Um, you know, a change in accounting policy um, 
you know, quite often. Um, if there's a, you know, it could be that we um, apply that retrospectively. Um, if it's a change in an estimate, it is prospectively. So it's important to know the difference between the two. Um, and obviously it's an error. It's a, a bad thing to acknowledge there's an error and you apply it retrospectively. I think and what's listen, important- could I, could, I give one, could I give one example? Just if you hop, hop yeah. back a slide and, and, and you'll notice that this is a fresh, a fresh topic, which is why we, we're, we're going yeah. back and forth today because it's relatively new. Um, uh, so I, I recently had um, a client who came to us out, from outside the firm who, who who actually did a fair value measurement calculation using an income approach. And I think a letter you had a nice you had a nice slide there with a yeah. measurement technique. So the evaluation technique was an income approach, um, and they actually did what they call we call that a level. Well, that, their, their particular income approach was it was mostly level two. What that meant was it actually didn't use mark, mark, direct market inputs or directly observable market inputs and, and, and let's say, you know, stock exchange type inputs, um, but they were mostly derived from those types of inputs. Um, and, and what they had done was um, that they had used a level two, they'd done an income approach, and that was their technique to get to their estimate of fair value. Um, the problem was is that thing, the, the particular thing they were valuing actually had a trading stock market where they could have actually got the directly observable valuation. Now there's a good example of um, they had a measurement technique, tick. Um, it was their policy to do it at fair value. So they were in the fair value standard. The policy was fair value, but they misapplied information that was actually available to them. So was that an estimate change? Well, it actually wasn't an estimate change because in that case, they actually just incorrectly used the information that was available to them. They should yeah. have used level one. And, and the reason why I'm using this particular example was they, they, they were one that kept saying to me, the income approach gave them a more prudent outcome. And that's why I used the prudent example earlier because they were trying very hard and, and, and I have to give, give credit to them. Um, they, they had the best intentions at heart. They weren't trying to overvalue the asset. They were trying to be prudent. But what they did was they chose policy, fair value. They chose a measurement technique, which was an income approach, but it should have been a market approach. And the standard tells you to use market approach first if it's level one or uh, and so forth. And so even though their valuation technique changed from income to market, which normally is an estimate change, because it's still trying to achieve fair value policy, but they'd misapplied the information in the past and so they actually also had an error. And that can just show you the complexity between deciding to decide where yeah. you are. Because if you move from an income to a market in a normal year and that move is appropriate, that's just an estimate change. But if you misapplied the, the, value, the, the, the measurement technique in the first place, then that's going to be an error. Um, so it is a very topical topic right now, which is why these things are changing, because trying to decide where you are in estimate inputs and so forth is actually quite relevant and quite important. And clearly they had a prior period adjustment, whereas normally a, a, a technique change is just a prospect of adjustment. Theirs was actually an error because they misapplied it to begin with. Um, so that, that there's a little example for you on how complicated this can be. That's a very good example. Thank you for sharing, Kevin. And I think the other thing that I wanted to do to maybe bring it together, Kevin, was to look at some of the disclosures. We know that IAS 1, Presentation of Financial Statements, have a specific requirement that says that an entity shall disclose information about assumptions that it makes about the future and other major sources of estimation uncertainty because estimation is a part of what we do. Uh, accounting estimates and using valuation techniques and using these inputs, it, it, this is what we do in accounting. So you have to disclose your assumptions, other major sources of estimation um, uncertainty that have a significant risk of resulting in a material adjustment to the carrying amount of whatever you've measured, assets, liability in your financials. And you have to disclose the nature, the nature of these assumptions um, and their carrying amount um, at the and the, the carrying amount of these assets liabilities at the end of the reporting period. So there's a clear requirement to to call out estimation, assets and liabilities subject to significant estimation and 
call out these assumptions. And I, I think that's often overlooked. And the other thing is there's also a requirement that we disclose our judgments. Um, so an entity shall disclose, and this is also in IAS 1, along with its significant accounting policies and other notes, the judgments apart from those involving estimation. So on the previous slide, I talked about estimations, assumptions around estimations. This one is a bit different. These are the judgments that management has made in the process of applying the entity's accounting policies. Um, and that have the most significant effect on the amount to recognize. So often you have to make a judgment call in applying policy. So our policy could be um, that we are, um, if we've got, um, if we've got significant influence um, um, over another entity, uh, we will um, apply equity accounting in that situation. But you need to apply your judgment to assess whether you've got significant influence or not. Um, and there are a lot of things to consider, and I know it's been a hot debate as well. Um, you know, it's not a hard and fast just 20%. I know there's a rebuttable presumption that if you've got 20% um, interest in another entity, you've got significant influence, but that's not always the case. So every time you make a big judgment, uh, you have to disclose that judgment. Um, and I think that's the other thing, you know, the disclosures are around what are our policies? What are the judgments that we make in order to implement these policies? What are the estimations that we make? Which items are subject to estimation? What assumptions do we make um, in order to get to those estimations? All of this fit together, and this is more and more what we see in accounting. Um, so I think, Kevin, that kind of brings it all back to how all of this ties back. Um, so over to you, how are accounting policies selected? You're on mute. This is probably going to be just, just a common observation about, about what I've seen in the last couple of months with those entities that have already started to do their transition to general purpose and also some of the entities trying to do IPOs. Um, I didn't come up with this myself. Um, I, I actually spent some time over the weekend because I'm sad and lonely and, and did, did some research <laughs> into into whether there'd actually been some some um, academic publications on choices in accounting policy, um, and and it's a bit of a bastardized answer. But but uh, over the weekend, I kind of discovered that there is a general tendency towards three strategies in accounting policy selection, um, and I'm going to start at the bottom. Um, it's actually a strategy three. There is no strategy mostly applied. And, and this came as a galloping shock to me, but what they mean by no strategy is there is no strategy applied by management to select accounting policies other than for tax purposes or for actual compliance purposes. But the reason why there's no strategy is because selecting accounting policies for tax isn't a financial reporting strategy, it's a tax strategy. So therefore, for financial reporting purposes, there's actually no strategy. And what that means is you really just prepare financials because you have to, you've got to lodge them, or because you want to use the same information for your tax returns. And so that's the tr traditional strategy of useful lives of, of asset depreciation equals what the tax the, the, the tax authority allows, such as the ATO. And, and about 90% or 95% of organizations are actually in that bucket. The strategy one and two are actually when, when you actually have an organization, and, 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 and it is true, mostly these will be listed entities that go for strategy one and strategy two, where either you're trying to maximize profit or an EBITDA number, or you're trying to maximize asset value or equity. Those are the two strategies, and those will drive your decisions to select certain accounting policies. What we mostly find in, in, in the work we do is, as I said, there's no strategy, or we actually find a situation where um, there will sometimes be no strategy for most other accounting policies and maybe strategy one or two for a particular transaction. So you might be trying to raise funds at the moment and you want to make sure that you don't, don't, don't in, impact your profit or loss in the way you're doing that. And so they will try and push for a, for a capital maintenance strategy just on that policy, but everything else is still sitting in the, in the no strategy. The reason why I brought this up is because if you're going to do the change now to I4S1 or IS8 to go for a, general, a special purpose to general purpose, 
the first step is actually deciding what strategy you want because it will drive all the other selections down the path. And the one I've already mentioned is, for example, do you revalue your property plan equipment or do you go cost-based? Mm. If you're going a revaluation strategy on property plan and equipment, you're actually going for strategy two, capital maintenance. But then all your policies should aim for capital maintenance. So don't then choose a policy somewhere else that contradicts that and just creates, you know, losses in 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 in, in, in um in your uh, your income statement. So that that's what we commonly observe. I think there's another slide behind that um, a letter on 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 a number of uh, an, another points that we've seen. Um, so that that that's just really um, you know how you go oh, and, that, and that's the last point I wanted to make which is what the slide is about a lot of the times your strategy needs to be linked or should be linked to your accounting systems can your information systems actually support yeah. your choice so for example if you're going to go for fair value of property plant and equipment do you have access to a valuation person who can do that for you? Because it's not, it's pointless choosing a revaluation policy on property planting equipment, but it, but you don't actually want to do annual revaluations and you don't have access to someone who can do that for you. And it's the same with treasury instruments and hedging and all those types of things. If you don't actually have the treasury function set up and you can't actually do those sorts of documentations for treasury, why would you choose a hedging strategy? Um, but if you're going to choose a hedging strategy, have you then also decided to put the investment into your systems to support that strategy because if your, your systems can't support the information every year or every six months depending on how often you prepare financials you're going to struggle every time with audit adjustments and and things go off the wagon really really quickly so how do we select these make sure you understand your management strategy your long-term plans make sure you understand what you're trying to do in terms of equity management or profit management and then do your system support that strategy and off you go? And that's how you really should be approaching this. And I will stop talking now and hand over to Aleta and Ashley again. No, that's fine. Thank you very much, Kevin. I thought the comments that, are, um, Kevin, when you put the slide together, I was thinking around the recent experiences we've had around uh, implementing the new IFRS 9, 15 and 16. Um, and that often uh, maybe people are thinking capital maintenance, maybe they're thinking we want the, the fair value of assets, we want to improve our balance sheet. Um, but you have to say that improves my balance sheet now. How is this going to play out in future? Because it could be that in future, I will have a bigger depreciation expense and therefore it's got a negative impact on my P&L in future. So to me, I think a pitfall is to just focus on a particular strategy at a point in time and not thinking how that strategy will play out over time. Uh, and, and obviously we often see that with, you know, um, when you transition to new standards, you usually have options available. Uh, and I, we often say to people, don't just think what's the best today, uh, think over time. Um, and maybe the best today is to do to revalue, but maybe that again brings that problem that you have to continue to revalue and do you want to incur that cost? So it's not just the actual numbers, it's the effort now as well as the ongoing effort. So I think it's more a holistic view which is um, really important. The, the, the basic alternatives across the standards, uh, when I was sitting back uh, putting the slides together, I was thinking where do these come from? Um, you know, there's a lot of estimates and there's a lot of judgments and um, the standards um, these days are uh, crafted and drafted fairly tightly. You look at facts and circumstances. Um, so where do these alternatives come, come, from, come, come from really? And obviously it comes from accounting policy choices, which I do think over my journey um, um, as an IFRS person, these choices have reduced. Over the years, if I think back, we had, um, I think, more choice in the olden days. Um, and also, the, the new thing that we're seeing, the new standards have introduced something called practical expedients. Um, and these practical expedients introduce a choice because you either, if you qualify for a practical expedient, you either use it or not. Um, so that gives you a choice. Um, and then often transitional requirements, when you transition to new standards, 
um, as new standards are, are issued, um, it gives you choice on how do you do it. And in Australia, obviously, at the moment, transitioning to general purpose, it introduces choice. Um, so these were like big picture choices or alternatives um, that I could see. I then tested it and I thought, let's look at the regulatory framework. Maybe stand back big picture before we jump into the standards. Um, if you look at um, whether you're going to do general purpose financial statements or not, and this is now in future, it's not at the moment, in future, uh, from 30 June next year, if you have to assess whether you're going to do general purpose financials or not, this is not a choice. This will be based on facts and circumstances. Um, you know, if you are required by legislation, it will say you have to comply with Australian accounting standards or accounting standards. So this is, I would say, a matter of fact. It's not a matter of choice. However, uh, you know, the next level, if you have to do general purpose financial statements, um, AASB 1053 talks about um, if you've got public accountability, and I've put the definition there, you are clearly tier one. Again, no choice. You have to do all recognition, measurement, presentation, disclosure. However, if you do not have public accountability and you end up in general purpose financial statements tier two, you end up with some choice. Um, because uh, if you're in tier two, you have the choice to stay within tier two and do the simplified disclosures under double ASB 1060, or you've got the choice to move up to tier one. So that's a choice that's available to you. So if you end up in tier one, that's where you are. If you're in tier two, you've got a choice to move up to tier one. And if you're an entity that uh, even in the new regime, um, you know, you can prepare special purpose financials because you're not required by legislation or trust, et cetera, to comply with Australian accounting standards. Obviously, you've got choice. Um, you have to, in an ideal world, apply with the recognition and measurement of the accounting standards, but you've got choice around disclosures. You can choose which disclosure requirements you want to comply with or not. And usually we would say a, a minimum would be the four standards that I've listed there. So even at a big picture level, there is some choice. You know, uh, there's some factual things, uh, but there, there's also some choice. Um, the other thing is when we, as Kevin um, um, discussed earlier, uh, when you go to general purpose financial statements from special purpose to general purpose, um, you know, you have choice and I've marked the choice and we've discussed it last month. You've got choice on whether you apply IFRS 1 or IS 8. Um, and there's an, in three of these alternatives, you make that decision. And again, we would think about that decision in the context, what's best now? Um, but also a bigger picture, what would be best for the organization, um, or, you know, on how do we determine uh, the cost or do we um, uh, use deemed cost, et cetera. If we move on to presentation of financial statements, you can see I've worked big picture and, and, and bring it down to the detail. If I look at presentation of financial statements, and in particular, if I start with IAS 1, uh, IAS 1 ultimately says you've got a choice when you prepare your statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. You can either do one statement of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, or you could do two statements where you have a statement of profit or loss and you have a statement of other comprehensive income. So it's a, it's a presentation um, choice. Also, when you look at your balance sheet or your statement of financial position, you have a choice whether you're going to present your statement of financial position with a split between current and non-current assets and liabilities, or whether you're going to go for a presentation based on liquidity. Um, and they would say, you know, a presentation based on liquidity provides information um, that is reliable and more relevant. You would only go where if you believe, um, you know, a presentation based on liquidity will give you more reliable, more relevant information. And that's where you have to apply your judgment. 
um, do we achieve that? Um, and another thing that we find a choice from a presentation perspective is your expenses can be classified as um, either by nature or by function. And we've given you an example of both. Again, it's a choice that's available uh, to the preparer of financial statements. If we continue and we look at, all right, in our financial statements, we also have statement of cash flows. Again, you've got some choices here. Uh, so what do we do with interest received? Where would we present it? What do we do with interest paid? Where do we present it? What do we do with dividends received? Where do we present it in our statement of cash flows? And, and, and I suppose the big choice, um, do we present our operating cash flows using the direct method or the indirect method? Um, Entities are encouraged to report cash flows from operating activities using the direct method, but we still have a choice. Uh, you could use the indirect method. Um, and uh, we thought we'll give you a, a bit of an example, what does an indirect method look like? Um, and, and, and there's some additional disclosures uh, around indirect method. Um, continuing on the theme of presentation choices, uh, you know, an, a very obvious one which Kevin also referred to earlier was the presentation choices around um, government grants and disclosure of government assistance. So if you receive grants that relate to assets, in your balance sheet, you've got a choice whether you will present it as deferred income or whether you'll deduct it uh, the duck the grant from the related asset. All right, so it, it there's a choice. Um, if you go for deduct the grant from the related asset, obviously it looks as if my, my, my if I just look at my gross assets, that would be a smaller amount. Um, but if I look at um, the situation where I looked at deferred income, um, I would still have gross assets at a higher amount and I've got deferred income um, as a credit amount. Um, so, 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 you know, how do you choose to present this? Um, if you've got grants related to assets in your P&L, how do you account for it? You know, if you've decided um, that you want to treat it as deferred income in your P&L, um, you will unwind it to other income. Um, but in, if you've used to deduct your grant from your uh, related asset, what will happen in profit and loss, you, it would reduce your depreciation expense. So really the recognition and measurement comes down to the same numbers, but you've got choice on how you want to present it in your financial statements. Similar, if you've got grants that are related to income, you could either have it as other income and your expenses are still the gross expense amount, or you could not book other income, but instead reduce the related expense. Again, you've got a presentation choice here. All right, so how do you want to present it? Now this one, if I think practically, um, what will we do around JobKeeper? Um, if you've received JobKeeper, will you, and JobKeeper clearly is a government grant, will you disclose JobKeeper as other income, or would you have JobKeeper as reducing the related salary expense? All right, so I, again, we've got choices available, and, and that's what Kevin referred to uh, earlier. Maybe some other presentation choices um, are around presentation currency. Now, functional currency is the currency of the primary economic environment in which the entity operates. And that is a matter of facts, circumstances. You make an assessment. There's no choice. There could, it could be significant judgment that you have to disclose, but there's no choice. Um, in contrast, presentation currency, the presentation currency in which you present your financials, that is a choice, whether it's Australian dollar, US dollar, etc. Um, so again, a, a presentation choice. Um, I thought I'll, I'll pause there for the second. Uh, Kevin, Ashley, any comments that you wanted to make at the higher level 
I, I just wanted to work down from the framework level to presentation choices before we move on to maybe more recognition uh, uh, choices. And when we look at assets, uh, Ashley, I think you're going to talk through the choices we have around inventories. Yeah, thanks, Aleda. Um, yeah, your last point on the presentation currency. So when you're looking at foreign exchange, we see this quite a lot. People, um, if your presentation currency isn't aligned with your functional currency, you can get quite volatility within your results. So that's probably a good one to highlight. All right, so moving on to inventories. Um, so IAS2, um, so the primary issue in accounting for inventories is the amount of cost to be recognised as an asset and carried forward until the related revenues are recognised. So the standard provides guidance on determining that cost um, and its subsequent recognition as an expense and also provides guidance on cost formulas that are used to assign cost to inventories. So the first point to consider, um, so there's various techniques allowed for the measurement of cost of inventory. So the first one there is the standard cost method. Um, and the other option is the retail method and either may be used for convenience if it results in the approximate cost. So just very high level, the standard cost takes into account normal levels of materials and supplies, labor, efficiency, and capacity utilization. Whereas the retail method um, generally used for measuring inventories of large numbers and rapidly changing items, all that have similar margins. So in this, using this method, um, the cost of inventory is determined by reducing the sales value of the inventory by the appropriate gross margin percentage. And then moving on, considering now the cost formulas <coughs> that are used to assign cost to inventories. So the flow chart here um, shows the different requirements and options available. Starting in the first box, uh, say we have an entity that sells a low volume of very high value inventories that are not ordinarily interchangeable, or if the entity engages in specific projects, we move to the right in the flow chart and the cost of these inventory items shall be assigned by using specific identification of their individual costs. So no choice in this instance, you have to use the specific costs for those inventory items. However, specific identification of costs is inappropriate where there are large numbers of items of inventory that are ordinarily interchangeable. And this is because the method of selecting those items that remain in inventories could be used to obtain predetermined effects on profit or loss. So instead, for these items, we would move down the flow chart and this is where you have the accounting policy choice, either to assign costs using FIFO or weighted average cost formula. Yeah, Ashley, and I always, when I was putting the slides together, and, and I'm sure you've seen the same, it's always this thing, what, in, in which situations do I have no choice? And in which situations can I decide what I want to do, right? That's the trick mm -hmm. here. Because yeah. here, it, you know, cost formulas is not just a, a, a free for all in all situations. You have to go and read the standard very carefully. And, and yeah, if you've answered yes to your first question, there's absolutely no choice. And I mm -hmm. think it's really easy to get ourselves tripped up on this. And the other thing that's interesting in, in financial statements, even though we've got no choice, in certain matters, we still disclose it in our financial statements as an accounting policy. So the fact that we disclose something as an accounting policy is not, I had a choice and this is what I chose. The fact that we disclose accounting policies is to provide useful information to the user who don't know all the standards. Right, so we say these are the policies we've applied. Some of them we had no choice. Some of them we picked what we wanted to apply, but the user doesn't care about that. They just want to know, you know, 
give me the information that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I think some people think, you know, as soon as you, I disclose it as an accounting policy, it must mean that I had some kind of choice in the matter. That's not always the case. No, exactly. And yeah, choosing your cost formulas, we um, generally, most entities we see use the weighted average method because it seems to be the most easy one to apply. Um, but it may not always be the most appropriate to use, um, especially if you purchase in bulk um, and there's significant time lapses between purchases, then it might be more appropriate to use a FIFO mm. method. Mm. Okay, so moving on, um, next looking at PP&E, which has been addressed a few times already in this webinar. Um, so the purpose of the standard is to prescribe the accounting treatment of PP&E so the users of financial statements can discern information about an entity's investments in its property, plant and equipment and the changes in such investments. As Kevin mentioned earlier, we have a basic accounting policy choice here, whether you present it at fair value or continue to recognise at cost. Um, and as also previously mentioned, if the revaluation model has been chosen, um, it's important to note that revaluations must be kept up to date at each reporting mm -hmm. period. So that there's no material difference between carrying amount and fair value. So it doesn't, mm. doesn't mean that you have to um, perform evaluation every reporting period, but you need to be aware of changes in circumstances that may mean that the asset's value has materially changed. So as you can probably appreciate, this can be quite onerous and costly, um, and also other drawbacks in applying the revaluation model is that any revaluation increments must be recognised directly in OCI, um, whereas the decreases go to the P&L. So again, this is looking at um, previously when we were discussing the strategy in your accounting policy choice is not just thinking about the potential uplift when you first move to revaluation, but thinking about future consequences um, and if revalued assets were to be sold at a later date at a gain, then the P&L wouldn't necessarily reflect this gain because you cannot recycle any surplus reserve through to the p and um, But saying that, so the obvious benefit of applying the revaluation model um, is the uplift in asset values. And it also actually may provide more relevant information, particularly where historical costs of assets are so outdated. Moving on to depreciation methods available. So under AASB 116, there's three different methods of calculating depreciation. However, this is another one of those situations where it's not exactly an accounting policy choice, um, as the method used must be the method that most closely reflects the expected pattern of consumption of future economic benefits embodied in the asset. So firstly, we have the straight line method, um, which is most relevant to use when an asset's value declines evenly over time. So for example, a piece of machinery or office furniture. Next is the diminishing balance method. Um, you would use when you have an asset that loses value quickly at the start and then loses less value over time. Um, yeah, think of a car, um, other types of production machinery. And then we've also got the units of production method, which should be used when an asset's lifespan is better calculated by how much it can produce rather than how long it will last. So this, um, this is generally the more complex method of the three, but is often quite popular as the depreciation charge moves in line with sales volumes, which can reduce some of the volatility in the P&L from year to year. So determining the most appropriate de depreciation method requires judgments and estimates. Um, and as you can see, it can greatly impact the entity's P&L, particularly if you have an asset heavy business. So it's an important one to think about um, and get right from the start. So there were my two topics um, 
Carletta, am I passing back to you for intangible assets? Yes. Thank you very much, Ashley. I thought after property, plant and equipment, we might have a, a very high level look at intangible assets. Um, so with intangible assets, we don't have a, a free choice on whether we would like to um, measure intangible assets using the cost model or the revaluation model. Um, you know, you first have to get past a threshold question, is there an active market for the intangible asset? Uh, because if there's no active market for the intangible asset, you can only use the cost model. There's no choice. However, um, if there is an active market for the intangible asset, you've got an accounting policy choice uh, between cost model and the revaluation model. Now, I'll have to say, um, you know, I know that in Australia, um, our regulator has a very firm view that there's no active market for intangible assets um, in Australia. I would say if you would like to use the revaluation model for intangible assets, because you think there's an active market for that intangible asset, I think we have to look at it very closely and exactly um, what an active market is. So I, I would say a, a word of caution um, around um, revaluing intangible assets. Um, yes, and a letter, if I can just step in there, it's um, actually become quite a um, hot topic recently when looking at cryptocurrencies and whether there's different types of currencies where you can say, yes, there's an active market, for example, Bitcoin, but then the other ones um, may not be. So you, you would fall in the ha having to recognise those ones at cost. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ashley. So, you know, I, I think the contrast here, that property, plant and equipment, you've got the free choice, where with intangible assets, you have to make an assessment first, whether you've got that active market or not. Um, and, you know, as we go through the presentation today, um, you know, more and more, you know, in my mind, it, you know, I can see that in certain situations, it's so clear what we have to do, or there's such a hard and fast rule and others, we have a choice. Um, but they are often so intrinsically linked, um, as this diagram illustrates very clearly. Um, it's not as if we can just talk about policies without thinking about the surrounding um, requirements that are set in stone. Um, and that's what makes it complex, obviously. Around investment property, against subsequent measurement uh, and accounting policy choice. Uh, I know around investment property, usually entities would go for the fair value model around investment property. Um, but again, we've got an accounting policy choice. So those were some of the assets that we've grouped together. A few of the other ones, um, I'm not looking at the whole of IFRS 9 here, but I thought I'll use this diagram, which is from old IFRS 9 training to maybe set the scene. And that is if you've got an investment in an equity instrument, we know you would fail at an instrument level that SPPI test solely for the purposes of principal and interest, um, because clearly you've got this instrument and there could be a potential capital um, gain or loss in future. Um, however, um, the normal rule is that investments in equity instruments are held for trading. Um, and, uh, you know, if it's held for, uh, sorry, the next question is, is it held for trading? And if it's held for trading, there's absolutely no choice. You have to account for these investments in equity instruments at fair value through profit and loss. However, if the equity instruments are not held for trading, for trading, you've got an irrevocable election on the day that you purchase the equity instrument to either put it um, through at, through fair value, um, a fair value through OCI or fair value through profit and loss. So it's an election; it's irrevocable on the day of the purchase of the instrument. Um, so you've got a choice there on how you account for these investments in equity instruments. But again, if you look at this diagram, if this equity instrument is held for training, for trading, there's absolutely no choice. There's a definitive answer. It's only when this equity instrument is not held for trading um, that you have a choice. 
Uh, so again, the two are so linked together, the strict hard and fast rules as opposed to uh, the choice or the option. Um, however, if we go further, um, when an entity prepares separate financial statements, and this is something we, we often do in Australia, um, the entity shall account for investments in subsidiaries, joint ventures and associates, either at cost, in accordance with IFRS 9, so that could be fair value through profit and loss or fair value through OCI on the previous slide, or we could use the equity method as described in IIS 28. So here we've got three options available, or if you look at it, could actually be four options available. So when an entity prepares separate financials, so that is just the parent entity financial statements, we've got a lot of choice. Um, the other thing I think that's interesting, I'm kind of looking at groups here, is around business combinations and how do we measure um, our goodwill. Uh, we could articulate it slightly differently. How do we measure our non-controlling interest? Um, because for each business combination, um, so you look at each one, you, can't, you don't need to have a policy. We're always doing it a certain way. For each business com combination, you would measure your NCI um, and therefore it will impact uh, the measurement of your goodwill. You will measure your NCI either at fair value or your NCI would be at the present ownership instrument's proportionate share in the recognized identifiable net assets. So if I, if NCI has a 20% shielding, it's 20% of the recognized identifiable net assets or that 20% could be recognized at fair value. So we talk about partial goodwill method or full goodwill method. Uh, so partial goodwill method, um, you measure your NCI at the share of the fair value of the identifiable assets, let's say 20% of the assets, or the full goodwill method, your NCI is at fair value. Now you can see the only difference between the two calculations of goodwill is the measurement of NCI. Um, and that flows through to your measurement of goodwill. And again, it's a choice on a business combination by business combination a basis. Um, also, if you look at an investment in an associate or a joint venture, um, um, I've put in yellow, uh, I've put in red there the may elect, which give you choice. Uh, that is, when an investment in an associate or a joint venture is held by um, or is held indirectly through an entity that is a venture capital organization, it's a mutual fund, a unit, trust, or similar entities, including investment-linked insurance funds, that entity may elect to measure the investment at fair value through profit and loss in accordance with IFRS 9 um, and not using um, the equity method. So again, there's a choice involved. And an entity shall make this election separately for each associate or joint venture. Uh, so again, you don't need a policy that they all um, at fair value through profit and loss or um, equity method. You've got a choice. Um, the Looking at income taxes in IAS 12, I was looking for choices. And the choices are really around accounting for non-refundable R&D incentives. If it's a refundable R&D incentive, and it was in our accounting news October last year, um, we treat it as government grant income. Um, however, if it's non-refundable R&D incentives, we've got an accounting policy choice. And there's really three alternatives available, the government grant approach, the income tax approach, or a split between the two. But again, we've got choice um, when we get to non-refundable R&D incentives. So I think at this stage, what we're trying to do is give a bit of an introduction um, around differences between this is what you have to do as opposed to you've got choice. And we also introduced a little bit of the difference between a change in an estimate or a change in an accounting policy and also errors. Um, and next month, we'll explore further the choices available in IFRS 15 around revenue, IFRS 16 leases, um, choices around impairment of assets, 
um, so really um, continuing uh, the series. Um, as we've said previously, you know, uh, if you need assistance to be ordered ready for 30 June, please contact us. Um, if you would like us <coughs> to help with an IFRS health check before you do an IPO, please feel free to contact us. Um, if you're thinking about transitioning to general purpose financial statements, um, please contact us to help you with any of these steps. Um, interested in virtual workshops, please register for those. Um, the four partners that you are more than welcome to contact or any of our team, uh, please do so. Um, Ashley, thank you to you and Kevin. I know Kevin had to run. Uh, Marie, thank you to you for contributing today on the payment uh, reporting um, to, uh, payment times reporting yes. scheme. We appreciate that. Thank no you problem. Very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks, Aleta. And Kevin did ask for me to pass on his goodbyes. He had to jump off. Yeah, I saw him disappear and I realised he must have a client meeting and we went uh, over time. But everybody who stayed with us for the duration, thank you very much and we'll speak to you again next month. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.